Okay, Massimo, I want to welcome you to the show today. Thanks. It's a pleasure to be here. Well, let me let my listeners know who I'm talking with today. I think that's a great, great place to start. So, uh, and I want to make sure I pronounce everything correctly, but Massimo, uh, Massimo Pigliucci. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, a PhD uh, is the Katie uh, Arani Professor of Philosophy at the uh, City College of New York and was previously a professor of ecology and evolution at Stony, Stony Brook University. You live in, in New York City. You're the author of 13 books and you're a second, second time returning guest because we talked about your previous book to this one here. But this one we're going to be talking about today is a field guide to a happy life, 53 brief lessons for living released in September of 2020. And, and you've also been published in the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, Philosophy Now, and Philosopher's Magazine, amongst others. You're the co-host of the Rationally Speaking podcast and former editor-in-chief of the magazine uh, Scientia Salon. Did I pronounce that correctly? Yes. That's All right. right. You hold a PhD in evolutionary biology at the University of Connecticut and a PhD in philosophy from the University of Tennessee. And your research includes philosophy of biology, the relationship between science and philosophy, the nature of pseudoscience, and the practical philosophy of stoicism. And you, uh, and as stoicism became popularized, became a driving force uh, in stoicism's resurgence uh, in the U.S. in the early 21st century. And you feel stoicism is a part of your Italian heritage, hmm. but uh, came to practice it after. This is interesting. I want to explore this after you became disenchanted with Buddhism. And you find both schools of thought share similarities. And there's a quote here that I'll end with. I actually tried to study Buddhism. This is one of your, one of your quotes. I actually tried to study Buddha, Buddhism for a bit, but the parts I managed to get exposed to felt alien, couched in cultural, linguistic, and conceptual terms that did not resonate with me. By contrast, when I picked up Epictetus, Marcus, or Seneca, I immediately felt at home. Right. So explain that. Well, you know, that's probably not unusual, right? I mean, there are, we, we all grow up in a certain cultural milieu and we're exposed to certain things and not others. We're familiar with one kind of discourse and not others. Now, that doesn't mean that there are no crossovers. There are plenty of people in the West, in Western culture that are interested in practicing uh, Buddhism. And yep. uh, some of my books have been translated in, uh, uh, you know, Chinese, Japanese, and Korean. So obviously, people in, in Eastern cultures are interested in Stoicism. So the, the certain isn't any any such a such a sharp divide between the two however i personally felt that when i was reading about buddhism uh the language was alien to me uh, it was couched in a way that just did not speak directly to me and also it was heavy on a type of metaphysics that i don't particularly go for uh, you know, all notions like karma and reincarnation and things like that. I, you know, I'm a, I'm a psycho humanist. I, I'm a, an, an atheist and materialist. So it's like, it, it's hard for me to wrap my mind around uh, that sort of approach to philosophy. And on the other hand, by, by contrast, stoicism was very much in line. Uh, most of it, not, not all of it, but most of it is very much in line with modern conceptions in metaphysics and in science. The, the Stoics were determinists, they were materialists, they thought that everything is made of matter. They thought that everything is connected by cause and effect. Uh, they thought that our soul, whatever one might mean by that, dies with our body and that's it, that's the end of the story. So. Uh, but more importantly, other than you know the metaphysics, it's the language that was definitely different. I mean, Seneca, part of it, again, I grew up with it. I, I translated Seneca from sure. Latin when I was in, in high school. Um, mm -hmm. I read Marcus Rudolph's Meditations when I was in college. So, And Epictetus, interestingly, I did not read before my more recent interest in Stoicism because Epictetus, even though he was a, a very well-known philosopher for like almost two millennia, Beginning with the 20th century, he kind of got into, you know, his, his name got into a little bit of an eclipse. And so most people, even people who, you know, I, I took a, uh, courses at the graduate level in ancient uh, Greek and Roman philosophy, and I never heard of Epictetus. That's, like, That's amazing. Yeah, it is amazing. Oh, and so, but book, when I, yeah, your sorry. Book is, uh, you know, your book is the, uh, uh, which I'm holding now, The Field Guide to a Happy Life. Um, you know, a part of this is all based on Epictetus, uh, uh, and and so uh, but, so let's let's talk. It would be interesting for you to tell us what who. Well, actually, let me reverse back to a, a second because um, the Stoicism 
is I don't look at stoicism as a religion. Right. I never had, I, I, but what is it? I think that would be interesting for people because I'm, you know, Catholic, we talk about Buddhism, we can talk about, right. uh, what do you think, how would you define it for a layman? What is stoicism? Because it's popular now. So like, why is it, it is. popular? It, it certainly is. Stoicism is a philosophy of life, like, uh, let's say, ethical culture or secular humanism uh, or existentialism, or, you know, there's a number of other examples in modern in modern terms. Uh, however, I would say actually the other way around that I think of every religion as being a philosophy of life, right? So I define a philosophy of life broadly as a body of thought that includes typically three components. It includes a metaphysics, meaning an account of how the world works or okay. hang together. Uh, ethics, that is an account of how we should live in the world. And then a set of practices. So think, for instance, you know, I grew up Catholic, so think of Christianity. Uh, in the case of a Christian, of course, the metaphysics includes a creator God who is all-powerful, all-knowing, benevolent, uh, who has set in motion things in a providential manner that cares uh, personally about us, you know, loves us and everything like that. That's the metaphysics or part of the Christian metaphysics. The ethics has to do with things like the Ten Commandments, the teachings of Jesus, you know, sure. the Gospels and all that sort of stuff. And the practices include going to church, listen to, listening to sermons, praying, uh, reading scripture, you know, that, all of that sort of stuff. So similarly, uh, a philosophy of life like Stoicism has the same three components. Okay. Uh, metaphysically speaking, as I said before, the Stoics are materialists and determinists. Um, the ancient Stoics believed that the universe itself is a living organism that endowed with what they call the logos, the ability to uh, act rationally. Modern Stoics, most modern Stoics don't think that. That part has been replaced by whatever comes out of, of modern physics, basically. So the, the universe as a set of dynamic processes okay. described by what we call the laws of nature. It has an ethics. Stoic ethics says that the most important thing in life is to become a better human being uh, and that we should live, uh, as the Stoics say, according to nature meaning that we should take seriously human nature. Human nature is distinguished, according to the Stoics, by the fact that we are capable of reason and that we are highly social animals. Okay. And so it turns out that a good human life is a life where you use your reason to solve problems and particularly to advance society, social living, uh, because that's what makes us flourish, uh, a good social, social life. Um, in terms of the practices, Stoics have their own kinds of meditations. They have... Uh, you know, things like uh, philosophical journaling, and maybe we can talk about this a little later on. Uh, they have, uh, they read their own texts, you know, they read ancient texts and modern texts, they, they reflect on them, they discuss them, and so on okay. and so forth. So it's a, it's a very similar thing. So instead of saying, you know, trying to fit like uh, uh, stoicism into the mold of religion, I would do, go the other way around and, and fit religions into the mold of a philosophy of life. A religion is a particular type of philosophy of life that happens to have a metaphysics that includes a supernatural element. And yeah, those three aspects. Right. Now, uh, one of my favorite uh, uh, books is the Tao Te Ching. And I picked it up probably in my early 20s. And uh, there's, there's a particular translation that I, I can't remember at the top of my head, but it, it is uh, essentially a, a philosophy of, of wisdom, but it's done in almost poetry format. Um, right. And it's certainly not a religion, uh, but what is it? What is it? What is the Tao, the way, uh, what is the Tao Te Ching and how, uh, as, as, and how would you, if I was a student in your class and I, raised my hand. I said, okay, what's the difference between Tao Te Ching and Stoicism? How would you answer? Well, the Tao Te Ching is a philosophy book. I mean, the fact that it's written in poetic uh, format uh, is interesting, but it's not unusual. It's not, it's not the only okay. thing. Like, uh, uh, for instance, one of the foundational, uh, uh, sorry, the foundational texts of Epicureanism, the Rerum Natura by Lucretius on the nature of things was a poem. Was written is written as a poem, so it's not it's not the only example you know that that we have. Sometimes philosophers write in poetry. Sometimes they write uh, stories, like Plato 
uh, is famous for his dialogues, right? Well, those are stories. Those are fictional stories. I mean, you know, some of the dialogues probably did happen somewhat. They're based on real uh, people. But of course, it's it's the, the writer's imagination that puts them in a particular way and presents them to the public in a particular way, right? So the Taoism is a type of philosophy of life, in, as, in, as it turns out. Uh, Taoism, Confucianism, and Buddhism, all three of them have fairly strong similarities with okay. Stoicism in terms of, the, especially in terms of the ethics. But they also are, there also are differences, of course, again, both in terms of the ethics and in terms of the metaphysics. And so if you are interested in, in Taoism, you need to pick up, you know, some, something that, other than the Tao, uh, uh, the, the, the foundational book itself. You also want to pick up texts that are, um, you know, explanatory and, and analyzing the philosophy, just like you would with, with Christianity or you would with yeah. uh, Buddhism, right? You don't, you don't just pick the, the Gospels and that's it. You, you need somebody to actually explain to you uh, what that means, because these were texts that were written two millennia, two and a half millennia ago, uh, using a particular language uh, with particular references and so on and so forth. So you need that, you know, you need a little bit of footnotes. You need a, sure, a, sure. a guide in order to... That's what's, that's what's fascinating, because I grew up a, a Catholic, and so... Um, and so in, 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 from the Boston area, so uh, it's not that that makes a difference, but it's just a strong Catholic influence from Boston. And so it was just an interesting, I, I love, I, I like reading these texts from, from the time frames they're in. And, and I'm curious because your book is based on Epictetus and I'm familiar with, I've read uh, some of Marcus Aurelius and his meditations and, and, and I'm familiar there. And I'm curious, you weren't even exposed as an expert in this. Uh, to Epictetus growing, growing through your training. Why is that? And, and uh, how, how come you, you dove deeply into his writings now? When I got into Stoicism uh, a number of years ago, the very first uh, author that I happened to, to read was Epictetus. And it was just by chance. It was like I, I picked up you know, the, the discourses and uh, I started reading and I said, oh, I've never heard of this guy. That's interesting. In fact, uh, probably part of the, the reason I, I started with Epictetus is precisely because I was unfamiliar with him. You know, I, I knew Seneca and I knew uh, Marcus Aurelius, but it's like Epictetus, what the hell is this guy? Turns out the first thing you you figure out about Epictetus is that he was actually a very interesting character in terms of as a human being. I mean, he started out as a slave, his life as a, as, as a slave. In fact, we don't actually know his real name. Epictetus just means acquired in mm. Greek. Oh, that's right? crazy. To indicate that he was a slave. <laughs> so... Uh, and you know, now he was brought to uh, to Rome, uh, where he was at the court of the emperor Nero, because he was a slave of one of Nero's close advisors, and so he was like extraordinary figure because he witnessed the the crazy Roman emperor right doing all all the, the things that that he did uh, during that period. He was exposed to you know the, the highest echelons of Roman society. He suffered as a slave. I mean, there, there is one. Um, a bit that he actually tells himself in the discourses where his master got upset with him and he started twisting his leg. And the Petitus looked at, at the master and looked at the leg and he said, uh, you know, if you keep doing that, it's going to break. And the master kept twisting it. And sure enough, the leg broke. And the Petitus said, I told you it was going to break. <laughs> and he was actually lame for the rest of his life. The only oh. one of the, the, the only two or three images that we have of Epictetus, it's actually with Couch. Uh, you know, he was, uh, he was lame for the rest of his life. Nevertheless, he managed to uh, eventually be freed. He became a free man, uh, which was not that unusual for sort of high level slaves, slaves that were actually, uh, you know, were able to learn to, to uh, go to school and to, you know, become somewhat more, you know, a little bit more uh, sophisticated, let's say, than just a, a manual, manual labor. He, was, he became a freed man. He started teaching Stoicism in Rome, and he pissed off uh, one of the emperors, the later emperors, Domitian. And in fact, the Stoics had this thing. They, they, they as we would put it today, they uh, spoke truth to power, and power usually doesn't like to be spoken truth uh, and and to. And uh, therefore, Domitian actually sent out a lot of philosophers away in exile, uh, away from Rome. Epictetus was one of them. But the joke eventually was on the emperor because Epictetus moved to northwestern Greece uh, in a, a town that still exists today called Nicopolis. 
And he reestablished this school there and it became the most famous school of the second or the early part of the second century. Uh, you know, every Roman, young Roman aristocrat who was anybody who wanted to become anybody went to school with uh, Epictetus. And in fact, one of the later, uh, later emperor, Adrian, uh, became a frequent visitor, apparently, uh, to the school. So this is a guy that had an incredible, uh, you know, life. He lived very long, very long life. He lived, uh, he died when he was about 90 years old. Wow. So it's interesting just as a character, right? Um, the little that we know, unfortunately, about him, we don't really know a lot more than what I just told you, basically. There is a biography of Epictetus that was written by, by one of his uh, most famous students, uh, Arian of Nicomedia, but unfortunately it's lost. We don't, we don't have any, any copy of it. Wow. But if you then pick up his writings, that's where really things come alive. Because as soon as I started reading Epictetus, I thought, holy crap, First of all, this is a no-nonsense kind of guy. He, he tells you things straight out. He doesn't, you know, he doesn't care about your feelings. He, he calls, he, he refers to his students as slaves. Um, Facts don't care uh, about your feelings. <laughs> yeah, he's like, you're a slave about this, and you're a base slave about that. He, he, he actually told them that they were slaves to their passions, to things that they care too much about, and uh -huh. they were distracted from doing the right, the right thing. So he's no nonsense kind of guy, doesn't mean words, and he has a very nice sense of humor, bordering, I would say, on sarcasm. Uh, so he's, he's, very, he's actually very funny if you, if, you, if you read Epictetus. And part of the reason he's a pleasure to read is because the two books that we have from Epictetus, the Discourses and the Enchiridion, which means the manual for a good life, they're not actually by him. He didn't write anything. Uh, you, just like Socrates, he didn't write anything down. They are by the, the guy that I mentioned earlier, Arian of Nicomedia. Sort of like the Bible. The Bible's not written. That's right. By, I mean, or the Gospels. That's right. Yeah, yes, right. exactly. Um, and um, so we don't really have his own writings. What we have is the transcripts of his conversations with his students mm. that he was doing after hours, right? So we don't, we don't have his lectures. We have the conversation, the kind of freewheeling conversations that he had with his students. So the, the, so the book, the, especially the discourses, is very much alive because you, 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 it feels like you are in the middle of the, of the room with Epictetus and you're, you're talking to him and he's, you know, he's, he's uh, either making fun of you or, or teaching you some, something. And, uh, and he's like, he's, he's in the room, he's right there. So as a as a uh, uh, as a expert in this, do you read do you read the native text in in the Greek that it was, uh, or do you have? I wish ancient Greek is really difficult to read, so I rather rely on very good translations because they're very good translation. For, lucky for me, I can read translations in multiple languages. Okay, which kind of interesting, uh, you know, <clears throat> things you know, English, Italian, of course, uh, Spanish. Uh, you can't access the Greek, but ancient Greek is difficult to read. And also yeah. it's very nuanced. It has very different, you know, the same exact sentence can be translated in a number of different ways, depending on the context. And wow. so it's far better to actually rely on, on good translations. As I said, luckily we have several very good modern translations. I do read Seneca in, in Latin, in the original Latin, but even there, I mean, I do that only when I just feel like, you know, the mood struck, strikes. But uh, other than that, I prefer translations because, again, uh, even though Latin is much more straightforward, um, in fact, almost every translation of Seneca is beautiful. And the reason for that is that it's really difficult to mistranslate Latin. You really have to be bad at mistranslating Latin. It's not an ambiguous language at all. It's a highly logical structure. Uh, right, right. So it, I love Latin. So it's very difficult not to get it right. But, uh, but in general, I, you know, it takes time to, to really translate from the original. Okay. And so it might, might as well go with what the professionals are doing and, and, you know, just, and focus on the philosophy. Because remember, my interest here is not as, an inch, as a scholar in ancient philosophy. I am not. My specialty is philosophy of science. My interest in Stoicism as a practice, as a practitioner, okay. as somebody who actually uses the philosophy for for life. Uh, so, so I I leave. I'm perfectly happy to leave the scholarship to the people who actually know how to do it. So it's interesting though that uh, I'm reading your book, um, Epictetus. Epictetus, Epictetus is, yes. is he? I'm reading some notes I made. Um, he's influenced. I might be wrong with this, but Adam Smith. Ben, ben Franklin, yes. Thomas Jefferson. Yes. And, and I'm sure the list goes on, but that's, um, 
that's powerful. I mean, Adam Smith really developed most of the economic philosophy of the, right. of the Western world. Uh, obviously, right. Ben Franklin, Thomas Jefferson, and um, George Washington is another one. Yep, yep. And and so, then also uh, George Washington, another one. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So it's and and I also made a note here that the Serenity Prayer is. I mean, it's, that's, that's a, that's a prayer, the serenity prayer. I'm going to actually, we need to link to that in the show notes. Um, but that's basically, I'm going to, I'm not going to say it full service, but it's grant me the wisdom to make the right decisions and know the difference, or maybe you can tell me what the, it's, um, the serenity prayer is an early 20th century Christian prayer, which is used as, you know, in, uh, uh, 12 step organizations like, uh, 12, uh, you know, uh, alcoholic anonymous. And it basically asks God to give you the wisdom to tell the difference between what you can change and what you cannot change yes, the yes. courage to change what you can and the serenity to accept what you cannot. Now, turns out, that's straight out of the Enchiridion. It's the very first paragraph of the Enchiridion. In fact, the Enchiridion is what Epictetus. The, sorry, the Enchiridion is, uh, that's right. It's uh, Epictetus' manual. And uh, the Enchiridion starts like this. Some things are up to us, while other things are not up to us. Within, uh, you know, up to us are opinion, motivation, desire, aversion, and in a word, whatever is our own doing. Not up to us are our body, our property, reputation, office, and in a word, whatever is not of our own doing. And then it continues and it says, and the things you want to do is to focus on the stuff that is up to you and to accept yes. with equanimity the part that it's not up to you. There is a reason why the serenity prayer or you know, in general sort of Christian, modern Christian sensibilities are sound familiar if you are familiar also with Stoic uh, philosophy. And the reason for that is because a lot of Stoicism was actually taken on board by the early Christians. Oh. Uh, Paul of Tarsus was fam familiar with Seneca's writings. Oh, really? He was? Instance. I didn't know that. Yes. Augustine was very familiar with the, with the Stoics. Tertullian, uh, one of the early church fathers, was familiar with the Stoics, okay. and they engaged with the, with the Stoics. Uh, in fact, uh, all the way down, down to Dante in the, in the comedy, uh, in Divine Comedy, he puts one of the major Stoics, uh, Cato the Younger, right at the beginning of Purgatory. He's the only pagan who is not in hell. And, and that's because he was basically an honorary Christian. He was such a good person. He was such a you know, high character that he was basically a Christian. So Stoicism has influenced Christianity throughout the Middle Ages. The Enchiridion, uh, Equitidus Manual, was uh, translated in Latin and used as a, from the original Greek. And it was used as a, as a manual, as a handbook by Christian monks throughout the Middle Ages for, for spiritual exercises. And it was very famous during the Renaissance. And as we mentioned a few minutes ago, uh, almost all, pretty much all the founding fathers of the United States had a copy of the Enchiridion in their, in their library. Uh, right. and, 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 uh, and um, George Washington actually went into battle with the Enchiridion. So he's like, you know, this is a guy that actually it's, has yeah, influenced it, a lot. <laughs> he, he, had a, he, he was meaningful. I mean, he's a powerful influence, yeah. uh, which is stunning when you think about it, that someone's thinking in philosophy can have that ripple effect for centuries uh, into right. the future. So, um, are, okay, I want to ask you about the, the title, because this is a relate to, it's um, a field guide, field guide uh, to a happy life. And so a lot of my listeners, probably they're, you know, they're, they're just, we're normal business leaders, uh, entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. And, and so it's, why am I bringing up a happy life? Why did I think this was meaningful? Because I actually want to, I want to, I want to uh, ask you about this because I actually dropped the word happy from my vocabulary a couple of years ago yeah. because I felt like it was setting, it was, it was a, um, it was a state that I felt was more something a marketing term that I was being sold versus something that was achievable. I mean, I guess it was, I looked at it more of an equanimity of satisfaction versus these peaks of happiness. And I'm curious right. for you, how the um, Stoics and you, uh, uh, what do you mean by a happy life? Yeah, no, that's a great question. Uh, you're, you're actually probably right to stay away from the word happiness uh, <laughs> in part because it has too many meanings. Uh, in different contexts, and it means very different things to, to different people. And so it's really never clear what exactly we're talking about uh, when we're talking about happiness. In fact, so much so that modern psychologists, modern psychologists have actually, uh, in some of the psychological literature at least, you, you actually find that they're not talking about happiness anymore. They're, they're using the Greek word, eudaimonia. Oh, which is... 
you know, okay. eudaimonia usually is translated as flourishing. As, flourishing, as, you know, okay. But more broadly, I think, and this is the conception that the Stoics certainly had, eudaimonia is the life worth living. Ah, so the, the point of a philosophy of life, whether it is Stoicism or Buddhism or, or Taoism or anything else, is to live a life that is that is worth living, the best life you can possibly See, that, live. That has that has power, a life worth living. I, I think that is that statement of words. I love that. I love thank you for clarifying that. Yeah, it's the kind of life that you get to the end and you look back and you say, Yeah, that was that was that was good. That was that yeah. was worth doing. It's good ride. As opposed to you know looking back and say, Oh crap, I I just you know I blew it. That, that was it. So that's what we're concerned about. And that is why, so I called it a field guide to a happy life uh, because first of all, life happens in the field. It's not a theoretical thing. It's, it's right. a practical, it's practical stuff, right? Uh, yes, philosophy is interesting and it's important uh, in terms of the theory, but the theory without the practice is useless. It's not, it's not a, it's, then, then it becomes just, uh, you know, navel gazing. It's, it's not, it's an exercise that it's in and on, it, and on itself. And it's not useful for, for, for people. And happiness there is in the title because uh, as a conversation starter, basically, as we're, yeah. as we're doing now, like what, because clearly somebody looks at the title and says, wait, what do you mean by happiness? And, you know, it's like, well, let me tell you. <laughs> so, so happiness here does mean the life worth living. For the Stoics, a life worth living, uh, as we were saying a few minutes ago, is a life of reason and pro-sociality, that is, where you become, where you do something for the world, when you do something that is good for other people. I right? see. And the reason for that is because we are animals who are capable of thinking and we're highly social. There is evidence from modern psychology that people do find meaning in life if they do things, things that are actually uh, concerning other people. That are used that they think are engaging or useful for other people. Even imagine even uh, activities that 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 might be pursued by just one person in his own or her own uh, thing, like a painter, for instance, or a musician. Right. You know, and we have the image of artists that just do their own thing by themselves. And it's like you know they they care about their music or their or their uh, writing, let's say, or their painting, but not really. Because all of those things are actually meant to touch other people, to, to make a contact with other people, to be enjoyed by other people, right? You know, no, no a writer writes just for his own personal thing. It's like, yes, it is something that you enjoy. It is certainly something that is meaningful because you like the process and all that. But ultimately, you want to get it published. And you want to get it published, yeah. not necessarily because you want to make a lot of money. Sure, everybody wants to write, you know, the, the, the next uh, big American novel or something, right? But that isn't really what drives artists or, write, or, or writers or things like that. What drives most of us, unless you're a sociopath, is uh, connection with other people. We want to make a connection. We want to make, uh, to write things that are read by other people, to uh, write music that is listened to by other people, who, to paint things that are actually lo looked at by other people. It's, it's relational, whether that's artistic or technological or anything else. What we find meaningful is something that actually touches other people. It puts us in contact with other people. And the Stoics would say, yes, of course, it is that way because we're social animals. And so it's, it's like, it's ingrained in us. It's kind of an, it's, a, it's an instinct that, that we have. Uh, that is one of the things that makes, uh, makes us happy, meaning that makes our life worth living. Uh, it's hard to imagine a worthwhile life if somebody spends it on a deserted island, you know, yeah. pursuing his own stuff on, on his own time. It's like, okay, sure. But that's the epitome of self-indulgence, right? And self-indulgence is not something that most people think makes for a good life. So the, let's say, if I can ask you a question about the making a good life and, the, and, and really exploring, because uh, I think that's where you get your superpowers from. I often ask people, what's their, where, what is your superpower? If you had to list, you have all these 10 capabilities that you're known for, but you have, if you had to lean into what your, 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 your superpower is, a lot of the folks that are listening really uh, get into motivating their teams they really, because they, they can only be as effective. It used to be in the technology that you could be, you were the smartest person in the room just by showing up. And even today, yeah. they still assume that, or uh, the, the, the business leaders around them still assume they're the smartest person in the room, but they know they don't get their power from them being smart. They get power from motivating the people uh, around them and help and enabling them. So 
how how do you and how do the ancients uh, encourage uh, the reflection necessary to keep exploring the what makes you happy, but what it is your unique gift that you you would give? You mentioned writing before. I wasn't yeah. sure that journaling is part of that process. Yeah, that is a good question. That's right. So there are there are several techniques or several approaches that the Stoics uh, use in order to pursue the fundamental goal, which is self-improvement, um, broadly speaking, and, and particularly ethical self-improvement. In fact, you, know, you, you often hear the word virtue thrown around when people talk about Stoicism or, uh, or other ancient philosophies, including, including uh, Confucianism. Confucians also have their vir the virtues that go after virtues. But virtue, in the case of the Greek and Romans, uh, really meant excellence because the word, the Greek word was arete, and arete just means excellence. Uh, you want to be the best you can be. That's, that, that was the goal. In whatever you're going to do, by sure, the way. Sure, sure. Right? Because the, even though the Stoics are focused on ethical excellence, on you know, becoming the best uh, person from an ethical perspective that you can be, they also thought that arete applies to everything else you do. So if you're a writer, you want to be an excellent writer. If you're a musician, you want to be an excellent musician. If you are a business person, you want to be a, an excellent business person, et cetera, et cetera. Arete is really broad. It's very all-encompassing. It's like, why wouldn't you want to be the best that you can be in whatever it is right, you right. decide to do, right? Why, why would you want to be mediocre or you know, the bottom of the barrel? Obviously, you want to be not the best, meaning you know, the best – often is, is understood in, in modern parlance as competitive, right? Oh, I need, I need to be number one and then everybody else is number two. That's not necessarily the, the, what the Stoics meant. What the Stoics meant was the best that you can be. And it's a pursuit over time, not necessarily right. a destination, which is Correct. indicative of a field guide means you're in the field kind of maneuvering. You're, it's not like a destination, which is, it seems Correct. like- it's, it's a process. A process. Exactly. Okay. It's a process. And the important thing is that you're going to try to do the best that you can do. In fact, as far as the Stoics are concerned, what the others are doing doesn't really matter because what the others are doing is under their control, not under our yeah. control. See, that, that's tricky though for people because people get lost in what everybody else thinks of them. Right. And, and, it's, and you, I was going to ask you this earlier, but it's like there's a high degree of selfishness needed to- um, to give yourself enough of a bubble to develop your excellence. But I don't know, I, I just, the word popped out, um, selfishness. But I think that's again, that an external, if someone is trying to be excellent, they need the time and space to be excellent in their craft because they're trying to bring something into the world to benefit others. But it, it takes a certain amount of selfishness to do that, wouldn't you say? Well, that's, that's an interesting way in which, you know, modern, moderns often put it in terms of selfishness versus, you know, uh, the opposite being altruism or something like that. But the Stoics didn't see it that way. Okay. The Stoics that didn't think that there was a sh this sharp divide that we see between selfishness and, you know, other regarding things. And the reason for that is because one of the characteristics of Stoic philosophy is that the Stoics are cosmopolitan. They think of themselves as member of this human family, the, the okay. human cosmopolis, right? Where everybody else is assumed to be considered to be brothers and sisters. They're all my brothers and sisters, whether they're actually members of my family uh, or they're on the other side of the world, it doesn't matter. They're human beings and they need to be treated accordingly with fairness, with respect, etc. Now, the goal of a stoic in a sense is to improve the human cosmopolis, to make the world a better place. Okay. Now, the, according to the Stoics, if you improve yourself, you're automatically making the world a better place. Yes. And vice versa, if you work for, uh, in some respect, to make the world a better place, you're automatically doing making things better for yourself. Okay. So there is really not such a contrast between between the two, right? Okay. So so there's a there's a strong belief with Stoics in individual agency, and you use the word deterministic. Is, is self is agency and your ability to influence things. To, it, like you have the ability to determine some of your trajectory. Is that what the, the, the ancients believed in, in regard to Stoics? To some extent. So agency for the Stoics is the most important characteristic that you could possibly have. Uh, oh, it's, okay. it's your ability to make decisions, you know, hopefully right decisions, the, the right. Correct, correct decisions, right? So uh, Epictetus especially uh, is focused on teaching his students how to arrive to, uh, at the best judgments possible. Uh, he has a word for our faculty of judgment, prohiresis, which literally means you know, volition, 
uh, making it. arriving at judgments. And he says, that's what you want to do. You want to make, you want to get the best prohiresis possible. Okay. Why? Because if you have good judgments, everything else that you do is going to be a good thing. If you have bad judgment, it doesn't matter how wealthy, healthy, famous, or whatever it is you are. If you're bad judgment, you're going to use those things badly. You're going to lose them or use them badly. So that's, you know, those things are not important in themselves. We tend to think that achievements are important in themselves, that, you know, money is important. Uh, you know, fame is important. The reputation is important. Those things for the Stoics are important because you use them correctly, because you, you, you do the right thing with them. And why do you do what I think? Because you have a good prohiresis. You have a good judgment. Right? I love that. So the first thing you want to go work on is, is really good, good judgment. Now, the determinism part comes in because the, the Stoics thought, in agreement with modern science pretty much, that the, the world is characterized by a complex web of cause and effect. Everything happens because it is preceded by causes. Okay? Uh, nothing happens without a cause. You know, it's, that's, one way to, that's a fancy way to say there are no miracles. Okay. Uh, you, you, don't, you don't get to do things that are completely disconnected from the rest of the universe. Everything you do is the result of other things that happened before, right. and it will affect things after you, right? And, so that's you're what, and that's the Stoics believe that or didn't believe that? The Stoics did believe that, and that's pretty much the picture of the world that we get from modern science. In modern science... Uh, is that the form of karma? So it's, it's a form of karma? They, so you, you basically are going to sow what you reap or reap what you sow? In a sense, however, the problem is the difference with karma is is crucial. In the case of karma or similar concepts, uh, it, it almost looks like there is a ledger somewhere that where somebody's sure. you know keeping track and it's it like, transcends lifetimes. Yeah, right. Okay. Um, in the case of the Stoics, it's not like necessarily... Bitcoin. It'd be like Bitcoin. Or... Yeah. Yeah. Right. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but in the, in the case of the Stoics, it simply means that whatever you do, it's going to have consequences. If you're if you have a bad judgment it's going to have bad consequences. And if you have good judgment, it's going to have good consequences. So really, you're completely in charge of your karma, in a sense. So in some sense, though, if you're, if you're judging, if you judge uh, even your negative things that happen to you as good, then really nothing can happen bad. I know that I'm oversimplifying it, but the ability to look at a situation, clear wins are wins, but even a loss can be a win. And if you can learn from it. And I think the natural tendency is people just to judge the bad things is bad. But in some respect, what you, what you just said, and I might be oversimplifying it, but a clear win is a win, but even a loss in some respect can be something that we learn from. Yes. Although that's a slightly different concept. So let's make a distinction here. Okay. Okay. That, that is, that is also found in Stoicism, but, it, but there is an important distinction to make. So for the Stoics, um, as I said, the only good thing, the only thing that is intrinsically good, really serious, good with a capital G, right, it, is your judgment. It's your good judgment. And the only thing that is really bad with a capital B is your bad judgment. Okay. And the reason for that, as I said before, is because from good judgment, good things come out. And from bad judgment, bad things come out, right? That's why judgment is the most important kind of thing that you want to work on. However, that said, they also did have an idea very similar to the one you just uh, uh, presented. And uh, that's a notion that there is a distinction between events, you know, facts, and judgments. We tend to think often today, we tend to think that uh, events and things come with a judgment attached. Yes. So let's say you're laid off from your work. It's like, oh, it's a bad thing. So it's automatically a bad thing. It's like, well, no. It's a thing. It, it is a fact, right? You had a job yesterday and you don't have a job today. That's a fact. That, that's a fact about the world that affects you. Whether it is good or bad, it actually is a matter of opinion. It depends on what you make out of it. Uh, sure, it has practical consequences. Like right now, if you're without a job, you have to look for another way to pay your bills and you know, to do your things, et cetera, et cetera. So it certainly has practical consequences. But you can choose to see that not as a catastrophe, but rather as an opportunity. You can choose that to see that to, to see it not as a setback, but rather as a challenge. Like, oh, you know what? As it turns out, I was yeah. kind of stuck in that job for a long time, and I didn't dare 
quitting. But now that I'm forced to quit because you know I'm out, then I, now I need to do something else. So now it becomes a positive thing. So the Stoics did, they were very careful at uh, separating the facts, a description of facts from the judge, value judgment. The value judgment is up to you. And gotcha. it's not true. But that see, that is so fact, huge. That is so huge. And yeah. for, you know, as far as a guide worth, you know, worth how to, how to live in life. I just, I love that because something happening and then the story we attach to it. Right. They ripped, they, they disassociated that or at least tried to. <laughs> Correct. That's right. Now you may, it may very well be that your judgment in a particular case happens to be reasonable, sure. but you still have in mind that you have to have in mind that that is a judgment. And as such, you can change it. You may not be able to change the facts on the ground, you know, you've been laid off. There's nothing you can do about it. That's outside of your control. But you can certainly change the way you think about what just happened, right? Uh, this is something that modern psychologists have actually studied quite a bit. It's called the framing effect. Oh, okay. So the typical thing, the, the typical example of the framing effect is suppose that you, you, you go to your doctor's office and the doctor greets you and says, so I looked at your analysis and, you know, there's going to be a 90% chance that you're going to survive. Or... Same exact situation. You walk into a doctor's office and the doctor looks at the analysis and says, you know, there's a 10% ch chance you're going to die. Now, 90% chance of surviving and 10% chance of dying is exactly the same thing. The doctor told you the same exact fact about, you know, fact of the matter. However, you're going to react very differently if he puts the emphasis on surviving as opposed to dying but right? this is this is leadership and frame this is this is this is leadership and it's personal that's why i say leader of one leader of any if you can lead one you can lead any it's like it's all about individual leading your own like six inches between your ears because then you may become a much better person influencing uh absolutely. your situation absolutely right well i i have two quite two final questions um what is the one question that you get asked the most that is a false belief or that oh no that's wrong but what's an assumption do people have about stoicism that comes up through either through students or through your podcast or through your comings and goings that if you, you wish you just had a, a tape loop that you could uh, you could play every single time? Uh, oh, I got it. Uh, it's the confusion that people make between stoicism with a capital S, the philosophy, and stoicism with a little s, the attitude of going through life with a stiff upper lip and suppressing emotions. Right? Okay, okay. Um, the two have pretty much very little to do with each other. I wouldn't say nothing, but pretty much little to do with each other. Stoicism is not about suppressing emotion for the simple reason that you cannot suppress your emotions. Emotions are not the kind of thing you can suppress. Uh, any psychology 101 student would, would be able to, to tell you that. So, and the ancient Stoics realized that. There is a wonderful book by uh, Seneca called On Anger, okay. where he says right at the beginning, if you start getting upset about something, you, you feel the, the first movement of anger, he calls it, like the, that physiological reaction. He's like, ah, right? Don't try to stop it, he says, because ah. it's impossible. You're going to be frustrated. In fact, you're going to get even more angry if you're trying to do that sort of stuff. What you should do instead, Seneca says, is to get out and go for a walk. So ah. in other words, disengage from sure. whatever is causing the, the anger. Why would you want to disengage from, from the anger? Because even though your anger may be justified, somebody may have done a, a wrong to you or, or, or may have that you've been witnessing an injustice or other people, you know, something, it, you may have good reasons to be angry, but you don't want to act on the basis of anger. And the reason for that is because anger is one of those emotions that the Stoics thought are unhealthy. Mm. And they defined an unhealthy emotion as one that interferes with your ability to reason correctly. Right? So when you're angry, like, it's like, ah, you, 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 impacts you, reason. Yes. You, you, it undermines reason. You don't want to act on the, on the basis of your, of that anger. What you want to do instead is you want to come down, you know, get yourself, take yourself the, you know, the time, uh, give yourself the time to come down and then go back to the situation and say, wait a minute. Number one, what, what was I so angry about? Uh, and number two, if there was a good reason, what can I actually do about it to address the issue as opposed to just, you know, becoming angry? However, this, may, this is the source of, you know, this kind of approach that I just, uh, just mentioned is, is why people so often think that Stoics are into suppressing emotions. Like, oh, you don't want to be angry. You want to suppress. Well, 
First of all, as I said, it's not a suppression, but also the Stoics recognize a second category of emotions that they uh, consider to be healthy. And not only those emotions shouldn't be avoided or shouldn't be, you know, you shouldn't go out for a walk. They actually should be cultivated mindfully in a positive fashion. Those emotions uh, include things like love, joy for the proper things, you know, joy, not joy at the fact that somebody died, but joy at the fact that, you know, there's been progress in the world on some, some issue or joy at the fact that you are friends, joy at the facts that you have loved ones, you know, things like that. And interestingly, a sense of justice. Okay. They thought that a sense of justice is a positive emotion is something that actually human beings should cultivate. They, we feel uh, we have an instinct for justice, Mm -hmm. uh, we, we have an instinct that, that, you know, something inside us that tells us this is wrong and this is, this is right. And we prefer the right and not the wrong. Okay. But that needs to be cultivated. That actually needs to be enhanced. You want to pay attention to it and, cult and cultivate it. So the stoic treatment of emotions is, is fairly sophisticated and it boils down to if it is a negative emotion, if it's an unhealthy emotion you're experiencing, you want to let it go as much as possible, as soon as possible, and then reason with it and try to say, what can I do about this to address whatever problem generated that emotion? If it is a positive, a healthy emotion, on the other hand, you want to engage in it and you want to cultivate it. I love that. Well, I think the one last question I have is really about um, trying to understand that did, this, did the Stoics <clears throat> believe in faith? And so... You've done your best job of dis disassociating uh, an event from a from an actual emotion, and you've gone and you're living uh, this this uh, this this process as 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 best possible. And then you run against a real serious block. D did how did they approach faith in the unknown beyond their own mind and beyond their own capabilities? And I'm just curious what your thoughts are on that. So that's an interesting question. The, the Stoics, of course, were very much into reason and not, you know, right, not right. faith, right? So, so it's like you, you can reason your way through your problems. However, they did have a concept of fate. Fate, okay. So, for instance, one of the one of my favorite uh, Stoic phrases uh, that, that recurs in, in the Stoic texts and, and that you're supposed to be using actually on a regular basis is, um, I will do something fate permitting. Fate. So, okay. Right. okay. So for instance, you know, when you uh, call me up to be on the, <clears throat> on these shows, I, 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 I should say something like, well, I'll be there fate permitting, meaning what? Meaning that it is my intention to be on your show. Right. right. But something might come up that might preclude that I might get sick or my Wi-Fi might not work that day, or I might be called on all of a sudden by a student and there is an emergency, you know, whatever it is, something might happen that gets in the way of what I want to do, right? And the distinction between those two things, fate and, what is, uh, and, and my intentions, is that my intentions are up to me, right? Those are one of those things that Epictetus says, that's really up to you, that's under your control. But the outcomes of my actions is not necessarily up to me. I may have the best intentions to be on your show and then all of a sudden something happens and I cannot be. So uh, the Stoics tell themselves and others that whenever they commit to something, they say fate permitting, meaning they call, it, they call this a reserve clause. Like, <laughs> I, I intend to do this, but other things may happen. But by fate, they don't mean anything particularly strange or supernatural. They just mean that there are causal mechanisms out there, cause and effect, relations of cause and effect out there that are not under my control. Yeah, yeah. Like the Wi-Fi, right? I depend yep. on a Wi-Fi provider. That's not under my control. Like the pandemic. Uh, yes, or the pandemic is definitely a thing that is not under my control, right? Pandemic is a perfect example so, of, the, of the dichotomy of control. So Epictetus would say, what is under your control in a pandemic are, your, again, your judgments, right? Now, your judgments include uh, your knowledge of what a pandemic is. You should, you should inform yourself. That doesn't mean you should become, a, all of a sudden, an expert, you know, an epidemiologist. But you should inform yourself about what's going on and about, you know, the basics, you know, virus one-on-one kind of thing, because you want to know what, what the hell is going on here. Why? Because that allows you to arrive at good judgments about what to do about it. Right? Yeah. So if I understand 
broadly speaking, viruses and pandemics, then I understand that I need to wear a mask. I need to social distance. I need to wash my hands. Right. You know, I need to get a vaccine as soon as possible. All of those things are good judgments. If I don't understand that, I have all sorts of bad judgments like, oh, it doesn't matter. I can go party. It's not, you know, without a mask. It doesn't matter. The virus is not going to get me. Of course, the outcome, the probability of the outcome is going to be very different, right? However, even if you do everything right, even if your judgment is completely correct, you still need to be prepared for the fact that viruses are sneaky things and that might get you. Right, right. The outcome is not up to you. So you can say, you know, I'm going to get through this pandemic in a healthy state, faith permitting. Faith permitting. Love it. That's great. So I want to highly recommend to my listeners a field guide to a happy life. And uh, by Massimo Pigliucci, or just, we just, uh, uh, I've, I've read this, I love it. What um, impact are, what impact do you want listeners to get uh, from this? A year from now, if we had this conversation, what kind of uh, feedback do you want to get from people that, as, that have read this? Well, ideally, uh, their life will be very different uh, yeah. and, and better. Uh, because, and that's not because I wrote that book. That book is actually an homage to Epictetus. It's an up, update and, and uh, uh, bring into modern language and modern concepts, yeah. Epictetus. So if there's anybody to thank, that would be Epictetus, not me. And, but if it has uh, an effect, it's going to be the same effect that Epictetus himself had on me. It's, it's, you're you're going to look at your life in a very, very different way, and you're going to act in a very different way. 100%. Well, half of the book is like real pure Epictetus and half of it is uh, really you spending some time yes. interpreting that, which I really enjoyed. And uh, so I, I really appreciate your time today, Massimo. This has been a pleasure uh, yet again, and I'm, I'm pretty fired up about this. Uh, so I, I, I know this is going to be um, well received by my audience. So thank you. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure. 